Hey everyone, it's me Mitch. I'm one of the pastors here at Suncrest and you're watching an episode of Suncrest On Demand. We're in a series of messages we're calling Unshaming and I can't wait to get going. So let's get started. I'm gonna start with a little thought experiment. This is not a gotcha. I'm not trying to trick you into something. I'm just wanting to get our minds moving in the right direction for something that's gonna be important for us conceptually tonight. So I'm gonna put three words up here on the screen. Uh, These are all good things. Uh, Relationships are good. Having good health is good. Money is good. Um, What I wanna ask everyone in the room to do, just in your mind, I'm not gonna ask you to say it out loud or tell your neighbor, is uh, I want you to rank order these three things from most important to least important. When it comes to your life, and you might have a different answer than the person sitting next to you. Which one's most important? Which one's second most important? And which one's least important? Acknowledging that they're all important. You got it? You got your one, two, three? All right, now here's what what I want you to think about. Depending how you rank them, I am curious for you if you feel like, yes, there's a, when I stop and think about it, there's a theoretical way to rank them that is either the same or different than how I actually live my life? Are you consistent with your theory and your practice? Or would you say, you know what, actually I'm off. I know, I know what's most important, but when I actually choose, I don't choose based on that. And one of the ways you would know is you'd take these different things and you'd say, which ones would you trade for the other? If you could trade your money for health, or your health for money, which direction would you go? And think about it more broadly than just paying for something. Of course, you might pay for healthcare, or if you need surgery, you pay for that. But the effort to make money might be taking a toll on your health, maybe a great toll. And you're definitely trading your health for money, okay? I just want want us to think about how we kind of rank order things, trading one for another. It'll be a big deal as we step into this second section of Romans chapter one. So last weekend, I started this series through the the book of Romans. It's a letter that the apostle Paul wrote to the church in Rome. We went through all 17 opening verses last week. There are eight verses this week, and I'm gonna go um, through them again this week. I may not do that the whole journey through Romans. Um, But I actually wanna start with the last of the eight verses so you can see where the passage ends, and then we're gonna work our way back through it and to it. But the, the last part of us helps us see what this is all about. It says, they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and they worshiped and served created things rather than the creator who is forever praised. Amen. Now, right in this verse, I hope that you can already see like the tension of this. There's a certain toughness to what we're going to encounter as we let things unfold today, and and really even kind of a tough love within it, that there's two big parts of this, and the end of it is might be what you expect, you know, to the, the Apostle Paul who had had an encounter with the resurrected Jesus who says, listen, we need to make sure we appreciate there's a creator, and that creator is forever praised. Amen. But he's acknowledging the tension with it, especially in theory and practice. If we would let ourselves think about it, he says, but a lot of us don't do this. Instead, what we do is we exchange the truth about God for a lie and we actually worship and serve. We give ourselves to, we give our attention to things that are created rather than the creator. Now, let's let's stop and pull this apart just just a little bit more for, for a moment. We, of course, are seeing something right here in this passage that is a fundamental attribute of God, and that is that he is creator. That he created everything that exists. That he created you. 
that you were given a design and he valued you and he, he designed you in a certain way for a certain purpose, as he did with everyone else in this room and as he did with everything in all of creation. And I think when we step back and we look at the creation of the world, more than one of us has been in awe before of the creator. We, we, we see the Milky Way galaxy. We see all the stars in the sky. We see the beauty of, of the, the earth. We, see, we, we appreciate the complexity of all creation. Even scientists sometimes just, just worship God in awe, in awe of the order to say, wow, what we have here, it had a designer, it had a creator. Let's, let's acknowledge that. And part of what he's doing here is he's helping us see a rank order. He, he, he's suggesting that there is an order to how things go. And God, the creator, is the one who brought everything into existence. Below him is all of creation. But at the top of creation, as you might know from Genesis 1, is actually you and me. And that's not arrogant. That, that's acknowledging what God says, at least according to the scriptures, about his creation. That he, he created human beings at the top of creation and everything else underneath that. I hope that you have an appreciation for that. He, he actually says that God placed his own image in you when he created you. You bear the image of God. You yourself have some creative capacity, reasoning capacity, moral capacity. You have all of those things and he placed those inside of you. And then all of the rest of creation, with some rank order to it actually, is underneath you, the animals and the plants and the, the, the earth and such. And, and that this is, this is, this is the orderliness that, that is intended in creation, that God is above us and everything else is below us. Now, some people are uncomfortable with authority structures, right? Something that ranks something above someone else or gives something authority over other things. And I can totally appreciate that, but, but almost all of us, um, also want authority structures. We just want the ones we want most of the time, but we want authority structures. And, and we can appreciate how authority structures have been built into this world, I think, from God to, to keep some order in this world. So let me talk just about that, just, just for a minute. There are healthy authority relationships, okay? And, and, and let's, let's just look at what that would mean for a second. In healthy authority relationships, I'm responsible to anyone who's above me. And you can think about it. We have this in our world. You know, we have students in classrooms and we have, we have teachers in classrooms over the students and we have administrators who are supposed to be guiding the teachers. That, that's an orderly structure. We, in the United States, we say the, the law is, is our authority. No one is above the law. That's how we like to think about it. And so then there's judges and there's police officers and things like that that are responsible to employ the law. And you and I, we have to submit to them under the law. And at work, you probably have an authority structure. I have an authority structure. Um, I'm responsible to our elders to guard and guide our church. I, I, I'm responsible to them, to anyone who's above me. And you probably have someone like that at work also. And the most, the most human nature tendency inside of us is to rebel against that. This was the garden of Eden where there was a structure and Adam and Eve had been given a lot of freedom. All they had to do was honor the authority and they started to wonder, maybe the authority doesn't have my best interest in mind. Maybe he, God, is holding out on me. Maybe I need to do it my own way instead of his way and not live in that structure. But for followers of Jesus, this is a big deal. The scriptures constantly speak that if you're a follower of Jesus, you ought to be the best worker in your workplace. You ought to be the best student at your school. You ought to be the one yielding to the authorities, those healthy authorities anytime. Now we don't understand there's unhealthy authority. I'm gonna talk about that in a second. And then there's the idea of if I'm the one in authority, I'm responsible for anyone below me. I'm responsible for them. And, and it's very important to think like that, that's my responsibility. It's my responsibility to, to teach them, to take care of them, to discipline them, to lead them, to help them grow, to not let them get away with things. 
That's true in a workplace structure. That's true in a school structure. That's true in a family structure. Parents are responsible for their children who are under their authority in order to do that. When, when there's healthy authority, this is beautiful because you are responsible to everyone above you and you're responsible for everything underneath you. And, and hear this, like, let me give you a little example. The scriptures say in creation that with humanity at the top of creation, that it's our role to fill the earth and subdue it. To fill the earth and subdue it. That, that's our responsibility to the earth. So it's not to worship the earth. We shouldn't put the earth up above us and act as though we just worship the earth. We should not do that. And we shouldn't abuse the earth. It, it's our responsibility to, to care for it and such. So getting that right is a really big deal. Of course, we know there are unhealthy <laughs> things that happen in authority relationships. And there's basically two things that happen. When someone in authority abuses their authority and because of their position, they can take advantage of someone who's below them. There are way too many horrible stories about that in essentially all of our institutions that we have in the Western world. It happens way too frequently. Someone takes their authority and instead of being responsible for someone, they abuse someone for their own gain. But there is another way that authority goes bad. And that is actually kind of the opposite, which is codependence. You know what codependence is? Codependence would mean there's someone underneath me who I'm responsible for, and they keep, keep making decisions that will cost them. But I don't want them to hurt. I don't want to be the bad guy. I want them to like me. I want to seem nice. And so I jump in and I clean up their mess and I don't make them take responsibility for it at all. And I do that over and over and over and over again. And the reason I do it actually is actually about me because I want you to like me and I want, I want everything to be okay. And people who are in authority, who do not let people experience the natural consequences of their actions are not handling their authority the right way. Being codependent, need, needing it to be about you, saving everyone from the consequences of their decisions. That's, a, that's, a, that's not healthy authority. So that's all gonna be in this passage today. And I wanna start with just one question. I won't spend too much time here, but here's the question. What do you give yourself to? Like if, if you're just saying, yeah, this is what I've given my life to. What do you, what do you give yourself to? You know, there's an old song. It's, I think probably most of us experience it, if you know what I'm talking about. It's kind of cheesy and kind of convicting all at the same time. How many of you know the song, Cats in the Cradle? Yeah? And it's a song about fatherhood. I actually wrote down the first line. My child arrived just the other day. He came to the world in the usual way. But there were planes to catch and there were bills to pay. And he learned to walk while I was away. Most of you know the song. You know the direction this is going. And if you ask the author of that song, what do you give yourself to? The answer was not, I give myself to my son and to my family. The answer was, I give myself to ambition. I give myself to work. I give myself to making money. And I miss out, I miss out on something. And then, you know how the song ends. The natural consequences play their way out. And later on in life, when he wishes his son would take time with him, it's turned out his son has prioritized other things also. Now, we've called this whole series, the whole front end of Romans, unshaming. And this starts to get at the core of why. There is a path to shame in our lives. And this is the path. Giving ourselves to lower, lesser things. Of course, the passage is going to end up with saying, well, essentially, do you worship God, the highest, most honorable thing? Or do you give your attention, your gratitude, your thanks, your desires, your, your time, your energy, your pursuit, the lower things, things that are created things, not the creator. And there is a great path to shame. And many, I mean, 
Some of you are sitting here, you're like, I know, Greg, I know. How many conversations, I mean, I've been a pastor a long time. I've had so many conversations with people who come to me, middle of life, late in life. And they're essentially saying, I gave myself to lesser things. I gave myself to work. And now my marriage is dead. I gave myself to the bottle. And then my anger got the best of me. And now I'm, my daughter doesn't ever want to see me again. I gave myself... This is the life of regret. When, when people start to live out these stories, what, what it turns into is they don't then want to really go tell the story anywhere. You get to a place in your life, you're a little bit ashamed of the choices that you've made or a lot. And then you, you start to isolate yourself because you don't want people to know the story. Or you, you go out and you tell the story, but <laughs> interestingly, you tell the story in a little different version. The truth is just a little bit too much. It's a little too hot to let that be the story that gets told. And while that can be dramatic with a marriage ending or a, a relationship ending because of a bottle or work, I mean, we, we can acknowledge, right, that a lot of times you just chase what you want. And we are master justifiers. We can figure out why if, if your spouse isn't treating you right, it's not that bad to look at some porn. You can justify that, like, like you, you, really, you would really like to be, be part of that group and they're doing something you don't think is probably quite right, but it's not that bad either. And then you go and you participate in it with them. And then when you walk away, so a lot of times the feeling is shame. Why? It's because we give ourselves to a lower thing, a lesser thing. When we know there's something more honorable, there's something higher, there's something more noble out there, and we didn't choose to give ourselves to that. But, is it, but it's, not even, it's not even just all sinful stuff. It's like, like life just slips away. Nobody feels great if you've been doom scrolling three nights in a row or three months in a row. Because just in, like, instead of the theoretical part of life, it's just the practical part of life to be like, I just spent my evening doing that. And then I did it again. And then I, I'm just giving myself to lesser things. When there's chances to go out there and make a difference, when there's causes that need you, when there's relationships to be enriched, this is where shame comes from. We, we just give ourselves to these lesser things. So... This is what this passage is going to let us unfold, and, and I will let it take one side turn, because as I told you last week, one of the reasons I'm doing Romans is I'm answering some questions that came up last fall when we had the series where you all asked me questions, and there's one in here as well. So I'm going to start back in Romans chapter, uh, kind of the last part of the, the verse from last week, because I want you to see the parallel as it leads into this week. It said, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel, because it's the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. And this is the beauty. The good news of Jesus helps us see the righteousness of God. Before Jesus came, many people thought that God was just about the rules. He was just about the rituals. He was about the religious practices. But when Jesus came, it helped open people's eyes and say, no, no, it's more than that. So, so in the gospel, the idea that God would send his son to bring us redemption out of our brokenness, man, we, the righteousness of God, now we can see it, it's revealed. Then starts our passage. The wrath of God is being revealed also. And the wrath of God, you know, I don't know how you feel about the wrath of God. I want you to know it's a true thing. It's probably not quite like you picture it. You know, if your version of wrath is like a God who is out of control, who's just angry and spiting and smacking and doing, like, like that's not the right picture of the wrath of God. Actually, th this is helping us to see this is the wrath of God being revealed. And one of the things that's going to happen is you're going to notice that repeatedly in this passage, it's going to say, and God gave them over to their lusts. And God gave them over to 
worshiping lesser things. And God gave them over to, because this is what God does. God is an authority who is not abusive and also who is not codependent. If you wanna walk away from God, if you wanna chase lesser things, he doesn't want you to. However, if you wanna walk away, you have a will. And he's going to give you over to that. And then you're going to experience the consequences of that. And the beautiful thing about God is that he always stands ready for you to come home. All you have to do is turn and come home and it can be reset immediately. But he will, he will not save you from the consequences of the choices that you're making if you don't turn around and come home. That is the, that is the wrath of God. And that's what's being revealed in the gospel that some people don't wanna be saved. Some people don't think they need to be saved. Some people think they're fine on their own. That is the wrath of God. It's being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and the wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Since what may have been known about God is plain to them because God has made it plain to them. And this is a very important conversation about how you and I perceive God. The scriptures are suggesting, and I, th I think we could get our mind around this, that, that just by creating the world and living in this world, there are certain qualities of God that we can appreciate and understand. It's made plain to us. But what do we do? What do we do? Man, we are prone to suppress the truth. Later this spring, um, I'm going to take my mom on a trip to Germany. Uh, she's almost entirely German in her heritage, thought she was until we did Ancestry DNA. Found out, ah, there's a little extra in there. So we're gonna go to Germany and we're gonna visit some places. And then we, we decided on this trip that we're, we're gonna go down to, to Munich because right outside of Munich, um, there's a former concentration camp called Dachau. And my grandfather, my mom's dad, who fought in World War II was part of liberating that camp as part of the American army. So I've been reading about these concentration camps and all over, and I, I came across, this is, um, this is heavy, okay? So I was reading an article about the first concentration camp that was liberated. And when the American forces got to this concentration camp, while they were getting there, of course, many in the German army tried to hide what had been going on. They tried to destroy all the evidence and things, but, but the American army got there too quickly and it was on display for everyone to see. General Patton himself was there. And when they walked into this camp, there were dead bodies just stacked and stacked and stacked. There were some stacked in one building. And the story is that General Patton Himself, tough man, could not handle it. He went outside and threw up, just couldn't. And General Patton was frustrated because he had a sense that the people who lived in the community right outside this concentration camp, they had to know what was going on. They had to know. And so he made the community leaders and people from the community, including the mayor and his wife of this community, come into this concentration camp and dig graves for these bodies. So they did. A week later, the mayor of that town and his wife were found at home, having hung themselves with a little note sitting off to the side. And it just said, we didn't know, but we knew. We didn't know, but we knew. I think that's what it means to suppress the truth. And to some degree, all of us do it, right? We, we can justify to say, oh, we didn't know, but we knew. We knew. You could probably look all throughout our lives. I hope this convicts us in a deep, deep way to say there, there's potentially a calling on your life that God's asking you to do something. He's asking you to step into something. He's asking you to sacrifice something. And you've been resisting it. 
It, resisting it enough that you can be like, oh, it wasn't clear. I didn't. And you can say, I didn't know, but you knew. We have habits and patterns in our lives and they're wrong. They're wrong. But you and I can go about ways of justifying the wrong things that we're, we're doing. Figuring out how it's not that bad or everyone's doing it. The Bible doesn't really say that. And we can say, we don't know. We didn't know, but we knew. And this is the journey humanity has been on forever. And I'm asking you today and asking myself to not be a person who suppresses the truth for my own purposes and have it lead me to lesser things, but instead to lift my eyes up and lift your eyes up and let the truth be the truth and go where it takes us. The scripture says, for since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen. He's saying to us that you, sh you should be able to look up at the Milky Way. You should be able to watch a baby being born. You should be able to look around and at this creation of humanity, at some of the beautiful things that happen and say, there's a creator. God is real. His divine nature is the sense of morality, of right and wrong. And in a world today where we might be so prone to say, oh, I'm not sure that's really wrong. I'm not sure there's anything wrong with that. I don't think it's that bad. I don't. And we take all the sting out of morality. We take all the sting out of right and wrong. Part of God's divine nature is to remind us, no, there's right. And there's wrong. And we could say, I didn't know, but we knew. And until we call right things right, and until we call wrong things wrong, and until we take responsibility first ourselves before pointing the fingers at other people who are doing things wrong. What are we doing? Well, we're not letting God be God. We're just focused on the lesser things. So we've been understood, been understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. One of the questions that came in during the series I did last fall, I'll let you ask all your questions. One of the, I didn't answer it in person, but the question was, Greg, what about people who live on planet Earth who have never heard the story of Jesus? Never heard about the gospel? Can they experience salvation? Can they experience God's grace in this life? Can they experience heaven forever with God? And I gotta tell you, it's a tough question. And there are theologians who look at this question in various ways and come at it and, and even come to various different answers about the nature of people who haven't had a chance to respond particularly to the good news of Jesus. But I, what I want to do is say, I think this scripture helps us. It helps us know that in, in all of humanity, we who have been created with the image of God, we should be able to look up and appreciate there is a God. He is our creator. He designed us. He knows what's best for us. He is worthy of our worship. And so if we worship him, that's a response. Also, there's a divine nature that says there is right and there is wrong. And one of the reasons I feel so strongly about us continuing, and, and the scriptures seem to be so strong about us continuing to take the message of Jesus to the ends of the earth, is that while I think it's, it's possible that there are people who have never heard the name of Jesus who do respond to God in that way, most don't. Most don't. They suppress the truth, just like we do. And even though they... They might say, we didn't know, but we knew. For although they knew God, they neither, neither glorified him nor gave thanks to him. This is two great tests for every human being. 
Do you glorify God? Does he get the glory? Do you worship him? And do you give thanks to him? Is your calculation about where you are on this earth and the things that you're experiencing, the good things, is your calculation that those are from God or that those are from you? That's the question. And if the calculation is they're from me, there would be no reason to thank God. But if God is creator and the giver of all things, then if I, I thank God, I routinely thank God. My eyes are up. It's not on lesser and lower things. It's on higher and more noble things. It's on him. That's a way to live. Instead, their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. And all they, although they claimed to be wise, they were fools. You know, in some of the confusion, and I'm gonna talk about this in more detail next week because Romans 1 goes there. In some of the confusion about morality and and standards that seem to be shifting underneath us today. And some of the confusion about that, isn't it interesting that sometimes it's, it's the most, there's people who seem the most educated or the most sophisticated that are actually introducing confusion instead of clarity to this. And, and, and with an arrogance of wisdom have lost a sense of truth and what is reality. We should think about those things. Ultimately, when you give yourself over to these things, that's a foolish move. Because while it may temporarily feel right, it ends in death. And so they exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like a mortal human being and birds, and animals, and reptiles. He's writing to the Roman people, of course, who, who had their Roman gods. And they, they had figured out, well, this is what we're going to worship. This is what we're going to give our attention to. This is what we're going to give our devotion to. And while you and I feel a little too sophisticated to think that, you know, Zeus or anyone else would be our God, that doesn't mean we don't worship created things rather than the creator. Therefore, God gave them over. This is where God says, if you want to go that way, I wish you wouldn't. There's always a path home, but I'm not going to stop you. God gave them over to their sinful desires of their hearts, to sexual impurity, for the degrading of their bodies with one another. And here it is. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie. And they, maybe we, worshipped and served things that are underneath us instead of the one who is above us. So, I want to ask you, would you give yourself to a few things? Would you give yourself to the one above rather than anything below. Every time a hedonistic desire hits you and you just think, I'd like to do that. That would be fun. That would feel good. I, it's a true desire. But you know it's lower and lesser and it is not going to take you where you want to go. Would you just... Give yourself to God, to the one above rather than things below. Would you give yourself to the one who's eternal rather than anything temporal? Oh, the temptations to chase the temporary things of this life. Things that will feel good in the short term. Things that I think I deserve based on the situation I'm in, but will be done tomorrow. When there is a God, the creator of all things, who has always been and who will always be and would like for us to always be with him forever, for eternity, would you give yourself to the, to the one eternal rather than things that are temporal? 
And would you give yourself to the one who created you, who knows you better than you know yourself, who loves you more than you could ever love even yourself, who has in mind the best for you, who has a purpose for you to live out in this life, something that's noble and difference-making and brings redemption and restoration to this broken world? Would you give yourself over to the one who created you and acknowledge the one who designed me ought to get to say what I'm supposed to do and not give yourself to things that are under you? Created things that ultimately only end in shame. How did Jesus say this? He was asked, what's the greatest command? He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength. He said, the second's like it. Love your neighbor, other human beings, everyone else who is created also in God's image. Let your whole life, your whole life be about these two things, loving God and loving others and let all the lesser things live lesser. There are amazing things that happen all around here at Suncrest all the time, from experiences for your kids to experiences for you and your spouse or friends. I know that if you're open to it, God can do some amazing things through what is happening right here at Suncrest. So you should check out suncrest.org to see all the details. You can find information about our weekend experiences, which have classes for kids birth through fifth grade and experiences for people middle school through adults in our auditorium. It's amazing. We have experiences Monday night specifically for students, sixth grade through 12th grade, and it is amazing right here at Suncrest. And you'll even find stuff about the summer for your kids, like camps. So you can go to suncrest.org forward slash camp to find all the details of how your kids can have a transformative experience this year. Check out suncrest.org for a lot more details about how you, your family, and your friends can experience change in your lives.
story I'll testify By Jesus Christ the righteous I'll justify This is my testimony Oh, I'm alive This is my testimony From death to life Cause grace we wrote my story I'll testify By Jesus Christ the righteous I'll justify This is my testimony Every week we pause everything we do both in person and on demand to focus on the love of Jesus during a time we call communion. It's where we take bread and juice that represent Jesus' body and his blood that was broken and poured out for you and me to know what real love and real life look like. For those of us who do follow Jesus, it's an opportunity for us to recenter and refocus ourselves on his love, the change that comes from his love, and the ways that we can live that out in ways that change the world around us. If you're watching this video and you wouldn't define yourself as someone who follows Jesus, I'm glad you're watching. Suncrest is an amazing and a safe environment for you to ask your questions and to wonder and explore what it looks like to follow Jesus. I'm gonna put a timer, some scripture on the screen here shortly. If you're gonna eat and drink, do so when you're ready. But for all of us, I wanna invite us to reflect on what God has spoken to you so far today. Thanks for joining us for another episode of Suncrest On Demand. If you liked this, hit the like button. If you know someone who needs to hear this, go ahead and hit the share button. And if you want to see more content like this from Suncrest Church, hit the subscribe button on our YouTube channel. I hope you join us next time as we continue this series of messages we're calling Unshaming, and I hope that you experience change that only comes from following Jesus. Bye now.